we may enter with joy upon the contemplation of those mighty acts. In the name of our crucified Lord, amen. The movie Till is important to watch and almost impossible to watch. Released last October, Till tells the story of the lynching of 14-year-old Emma Till, a black teenager in Money, Mississippi in August of 1955. Till descended from Black slaves and sharecroppers had been born in Chicago and raised there by his mother, Mamie Till, after the death of his father in World War II. Till was visiting relatives in Mississippi, and his abduction, torture, and murder took place as retribution for something he may have said to a white woman working as a cashier in the town of Money. The heart of the film, Till, opens in Chicago after the boy's body is returned by train to his mother. After she views her son's bloated and mutilated body, she collapses next to the autopsy table. And then she, show, she slowly stands up. Jean, she says to her companion and future husband, Jean Mobley, Jean, can you go back to my place and bring back Emmett's black suit, the one he wore last Christmas? Mama can tell you exactly where it is. And make sure to get my black dress that Emmett would approve of and his matching tie. Emmett loved that suit. It's how he'd like to be seen. Seen? Seen, says Jean. Mamie, Emmett's in no kind of shape to be seen. He's in just the right shape, counters Mamie. The whole world has to see, she says, her voice beginning to falter. What happened to my son? As you may already know, Mamie insisted on an open casket during visiting hours, and a photograph of Mamie and Jean with Emmett's body appeared on the cover the very next week of Jet Magazine. Emmett's murderers were acquitted the next month by an all-white jury in Mississippi, but later, under immunity from prosecution, they confessed to Emmett's murder for a $4,000 fee from Look Magazine. Till's murder, and specifically the image of his lifeless and beaten body, touched off what Merrily Evers would later call a worldwide clamor. Eyes on the Prize, a celebrated documentary account of the civil rights movement, begins here with Till's murder and his mother's fearless witnessing. I thought of Emma Till and I just couldn't move back, Rosa Parks would later say of her decision to sit in the front of the bus in Montgomery it wasn't until last year, though, 2022, that Congress passed legislation, the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act, making lynching a federal hate crime 67 years after this boy's death. The contemplation of those mighty acts we pray this morning. Mighty good, mighty evil. Have you ever noticed how often scripture begs us, beseeches us to keep our eyes open? We've heard already this morning about the triumph, about Jesus who, with a cagey sense of street theater and public gesture, enters into Jerusalem in a parody of military triumph, his humble donkey, a parody perhaps of Roman 
military steeds, the green blades, his followers wave, perhaps mocking in imitation, imperial swords and spears. As we will live again the story this morning and this week, though, we will live through the rapid fall into betrayal and abandonment and torture and death. Mamie Till Mobley was a devout Christian. She knew without a doubt this line from John's Gospel that we will hear together on Friday. They will look upon the one they have pierced. And I think that like that Jesus of John's who smeared mud on the eyelids of the man born blind, remember him from a few weeks ago? I think that like that Jesus of John's with the mud, Mamie Till Mobley wanted us collectively to go and wash, and she wanted us to see. I wonder what her word would be in these weeks to the parents of children in Nashville, or for that matter, Buffalo or Uvalde, Texas. What would she see in them? What would her word be to us? So to this week, what and how will we see? Was there a crown of thorns? What actually did the two on either side of him say to each other? Did Pilate's wife have a dream? And did Pilate literally wash his hands of the whole matter? Of course, the four accounts we have of that awful morning and noon don't always square. But in the telling of his trial, of his being paraded out to Calvary like a wounded circus animal, in the telling of his crucifixion and death, the four to me seem to overlap as they don't in other places. The breakneck narrative pace slows. The mind's eye lingers on any number of details, a red or a purple robe, a sponge soaked in sour wine, an enraged cleric tearing his robes. It's been suggested that these hours, in fact, are where our gospels and where our faith begin. With eyewitnesses, unblinking eyewitnesses, at first furtively walking the route, telling the story. That's the stone bench. They took him that way. Here is where Simon of Cyrene was stopped. The crosses were there and there and there. I was standing here. It seems to me that in Jerusalem, this story or some version of it has probably been told on most days since that first day. The birth stories differ, the healing and feeding stories differ, the resurrection accounts differ wildly and gloriously. But these Good Friday hours live forever in a kind of sharp focus for us. Were you there? No. Neither was I. But some of the Gospels tell us of women standing at a distance, watching these things. Mary Magdalene and a group of mothers. Mary, the mother of James and Joseph. The mother of the sons of Zebedee. Mothers. Eyes wide open. Jesus was silent. Matthew will tell us a bit later this morning. But perhaps the gospel itself embodies an answer. Off, often, truth is what is revealed when we, the bystanders, stop talking, stand still, and let the story enter us. We remember. We record. Those women, these mothers, that other disciple, is why we have this story. We have it because they were just looking. We have it because they didn't blink. They stood still. When you pray, move your feet, is the mantra for many of us. 
At about this time last year, I stood in the cold on Boston Common listening to one of our congressional representatives, Ianna Presley. She reminded us that when we pray, we need to move our feet. The event was a demonstration on Boston Common in solidarity with the people of the Ukraine, of Ukraine. What I'd like to suggest to you this particular morning, however, is that Holy Week is not primarily about activity. It's not about good deeds or moving your feet necessarily. It's not even primarily about our creed and our prayers. His feet, the feet of these women, the feet of the one witnessing disciple, did not move. And neither perhaps should ours for a time. Instead, regard. Regard. To behold. To regard is perhaps the point of this Holy Week. The point of thousands of saints and patrons painted over and over, standing for centuries at the foot of the cross, stock still and daring to look up. Lancelot Andrews, Anglican bishop and scholar, during the reign of Elizabeth I and James I, preached on Good Friday in 1604 that the passion of Jesus, quote, ripens us for regard. Ripens us for regard. Just look. Behold, the eye has to travel. Be changed by what you will see. I don't want a chaplain to tell me something, said a man to me once, when I was first learning about pastoral visiting. I was serving in Bridgeport Hospital. I was sitting in his room with him. Cancer had consumed a good deal of his jaw and mouth, and I was sitting next to his bed. I don't want a chaplain to tell me something, said the man. I just want someone to look at me as if they understand at least a part of what I am living through. He wasn't asking for much. And at the same time, he was asking me for that which means everything. Non-judgmental, loving regard. He wanted me to see him freed from the pressure to say the right thing, the memorable thing, the edifying thing. I tried. What is crucifixion to its Roman conceivers, after all, but a perverse form of display? The police state wishes us to see, to regard something, the dissident reduced to an abject vulnerability and lack of control. The God of the cross wishes us to regard something too, something different, unbounded love, a love without limits, a higher vulnerability, not a higher power, a creative lack of control. Look, see, regard. Human blood, just like your blood. Here is the man, ecce homo says Pilate, and here too is your God, a God who in an act of divine self-limitation has somehow given us the keys, is showing us beauty and goodness and truth, has offered us stewardship of nature, the capacity to reconcile, the power to love, and all at the same time, this is a God who leaves us free to commit so much that denies and willfully undermines all of the above. What more wondrous love is there, finally, than that which releases the beloved to a place beyond willfulness and control? 
What do these women, these mothers, see as darkness falls at noon? They are by now beyond a certain kind of hope, a certain kind of planning or intervention or rescue. They do not yet see the resurrection coming. They are not yet running towards an empty tomb. Instead, they are standing still, fully present, stock still, eyes wide open, just looking. <laughs> 